Okay, well, thank you all in the internets, and thank you all, all of you here uh, live in New York. Uh, as you know, uh, uh, I'm, a, I'm a, both a private astronaut, but, a, but an astronaut of a different type in the sense of, uh, if you heard me speak earlier in the press conference, my, my father was a more traditional astronaut, a NASA astronaut. He flew twice in space on Skylab, uh, as well as the shuttle. But I flew uh, privately. I helped, uh, uh, as was mentioned in the introduction, start part of the civilian space uh, industry by uh, helping to co-found the XPRIZE and building a company called Space Adventures, which has flown all private, all seven private citizens who have flown in space have flown with my company. But what I want to talk about is the new golden age of space flight that I think we're entering right now, that I think the, the younger people here in this audience and the people building these space apps, uh, you know, you're going to get to participate in space at a time when I think it is particularly exciting. You know, 50 years ago, it was literally Sputnik that inspired my father to apply to NASA to become uh, an astronaut. And hang on, I'm getting a little bit of a blip on the video there. Looks like it's coming back. Um, and, uh, uh, and he actually had a, a laboratory at Stanford University that was one of the first and only groups to be able to listen to Sputnik as its beep, beep, beep went across the sky. And uh, he then said, you know, I want to be a part of that. And since he was a radio astronomer at the time, his skills were particularly useful. And he eventually flew twice, uh, first on Skylab and then on the, uh, on the space shuttle. And in that first decade, in the Apollo era, we did a lot. You know, we went from, you know, humanity never having put anything into space to walking, people walking on the surface of the moon. Uh, you know, a great, you know, a, really a stunning amount of achievement in a very short period of time. And that era also was very inspirational. Any of us that are, any of us gray hairs in the room who might uh, remember uh, being around during the Apollo period, uh, you know, know how much that really uh, inspired everyone on Earth, but especially here in the United States. And it really caused, I actually think that's part of the reason there was a tech boom was riding on the heels of that great wave. But something was not achieved. And what, what wasn't achieved was we never achieved that Stanley Kubrick 2001 vision of the future. I mean, in the 80s and in the 90s, I, we literally thought that was going to be what we were all going to be doing in just a handful of years. But something happened. We, we, we never really made it. Uh, we do have a space station, but it, uh, it's not nearly that big, and we don't have uh, liners that take us back and forth to the moon. Uh, and what really happened was the reality set in of the difficulty of the current methods of reaching space. You know, space you know, rockets today are expensive. They're fairly dangerous. And when you put those two things together, it's understandable that therefore they'll be pretty rare. And for the last 30 years, we've basically been stuck in low Earth orbit. And you know, even this marvelous space station that uh, you know, three of us here today have had the, jet, the great pleasure to go up and, and, and live aboard, you know, if you do the economic analysis, you know, it costs us almost $100 billion to put it in orbit. It costs us $2 billion a year just to keep it in orbit. On the shuttle, it costs somewhere you know, north of $100 million per astronaut to put them onto the space station. You know, when it's that expensive and that dangerous, uh, it makes sense that uh, you know, we, we, we don't do it very much. And, and, and frankly, public support, public interest and support for what was going on in space over that same 30-year period was lackluster. And in fact, if anything, was trending downwards. And the congressional appropriations to space was, had always been trending downwards. And, uh, and while that's all been true, I don't think it needs to be true. And I think we're at a stage now where we're reversing that trend very rapidly with some really exciting results. In fact, I would actually argue that you know, my own journey and that of, uh, of Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk and many of the other competitors for the X Prize, these are all people who were inspired by Apollo in the first place to go into a lot of these digital STEMI kind of things. We're not kind of circling back and re-participating in the thing that kicked us off in this first place, which was space. And you know, and for me, you know, I, I grew up in a, a, a household where not only my dad an astronaut, but literally my left and right neighbors were astronauts. I just assumed, you know, when everybody grew up, you go to space because that pretty much was the case. And, uh, but a NASA doctor told me that because I wore glasses that I was no longer eligible to be a NASA astronaut. And at the age of 13, I was crushed. Uh, and I felt like I was kicked out of the club that my parents and neighbors were all members of. And I vowed that one day I was going to fly into space privately since I was not you know, going to be accepted as a NASA astronaut. Uh, and of course, at the age of 13, you don't really do much towards that. 
Uh, and in the meantime, I got about, uh, I was very lucky to find my way into a new career, which was writing computer games. And um, with my father as an astronaut, my mother as an artist, uh, I think of computer games as the quintessential high-tech art. Uh, and I had, a, had so far I had a great career and I still make computer games. If you, if you haven't played it in my Ultima series of computer games, which I'm probably best known for, the term avatar, which you probably have heard, it was created in my games. Uh, the the top popular category called massively multiplayer games, everybody plays through the internet together in one central server, virtual world. I created that category of games. Uh, and that has, that success in gaming has funded my ability to invest in exploration companies, specifically trying to get myself back into space or up into space. And while I've had many failures along the way, I kept at it and kept getting smarter and kept reapplying new solutions. And uh, most recently, you know, did those things you heard me mention, the XPRIZE and Space Adventures, which ultimately opened the door. <clears throat> and then finally on October 12th, of, uh, five years ago, I managed to make my uh, first, hopefully not last, uh, off-planet trip, uh, and I became the 483rd person to, to leave the Earth. And, uh, and since my father was an astronaut, as you know, uh, I became the first generational American to fly in space, and I flew actually in space with the first generational Russian. So, uh, and since then, there's been one more. So there's now three second-generation uh, astronauts at this point. And, uh, and far from being a space tourist, which is how private citizens are often referred to. I definitely do not believe I was a space tourist. I use the term private astronaut. I think I did a very serious, very heavy load of commercial and scientific work. That's just some of it. Uh, and, and in particular, we talked about, we were, uh, Katie was talking about some uh, uh, protein crystal research that she did. Uh, my father helped champion that on his shuttle flight. Uh, and, uh, uh, and we've actually flown, the experiment that I flew, just flew on a Dragon capsule just some months ago. Uh, and it continues to fly, uh, developing uh, uh, results that uh, we believe are, are highly valuable for uh, pharmaceutical companies. I mentioned in the press conference another thing that I did, uh, which was to take, uh, I wanted to take pictures of the same targets my father took on Skylab. Because Skylab was the first time we had people on orbit taking pictures of the Earth. Uh, prior to Skylab, people were on their way to the moon and back. And so the from, from a photographic archive of humanity looking at the Earth, Skylab was the first data set we have. And as my father's son, I wanted to go back 35 years later and take some of the same shots. But the problem is, there was no tools that existed for me to load up that data into uh, to be able to know what to take pictures of from space and what lenses to use at what moments in time and which direction to look. Uh, and so I actually helped develop a piece of software that overcomes this problem. You know, when you want to take a picture out the window, the, pr pr the previous way was you would get a printout that looked like this. It would, the yellow arrow shows you where you're flying across the Earth. You might be wanting to take a picture of Perth so you can kind of orient your body and go, okay, well, that's going to be on our left side, and it's going to be somewhere near 6.20 p.m., but, you know, good luck watching your watch and what's out the window and orienting the piece of paper and it looking even similar enough to recognize. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, there was a piece of software that the Russians had developed, but it was running on a machine that was not near the window. You couldn't take it to the window. And it didn't have a lot of these capabilities. Uh, and in fact, if you're looking out, like if you're gonna take a picture of Everest, where you're going like, well, there's a bunch of mountains down there. Which one you know, am I supposed to take a picture of? And so this is the tool that I helped develop. It's called Windows on Earth. It had a scrolling kind of Google Earth map view of what's out the window. It showed you the red circles were exactly what targets you wanted to take. The size of the circle was what lens you needed to use. Uh, had countdown timers on that right band to show you, you know, which targets were coming up in the certain numbers of minutes. Uh, and the bottom band was even showing you multiple orbits ahead, kind of the density of targets that were upcoming so you could know if you could take a break or something to uh, uh, you know, go to the bathroom or something you know, if you needed to. Um, and that software was actually so successful that my crewmates who were used to using pieces of paper, I had loaded all their targets into my software before we went up, uh, and they quickly realized that they no longer wanted the pieces of paper, they wanted my software at my window. And so you can see uh, uh, it's sitting there uh, just to the right of center of the screen is my software, uh, and they all called, they claimed uh, uh, precedence of, of uh, seniority on me, kicked me out of the window, used my software, and, and, and I, I was left to take pictures of them instead. And Here's why I think we're now going to this golden era and the part that I think all of you can play. You know, NASA, clearly the, the spin-offs of NASA technology uh, is enormous. 
And if you study it in detail, you can see that. But the general public doesn't see it nearly as well as those who are in the industry. And when you're doing something like Apollo, uh, the inspiration value is pretty self-evident and it's, a, it's such a big deal, everybody's watching on television. But now, space launches are so frequent uh, that they are rarely covered even on television, uh, much less that most people will be, be watching it. And so inspiration, I think, is no longer enough. Uh, I think we really have to get into a mode where uh, the return on investment from a taxpayer perspective is much more obvious than it has been in the past. And fortunately, I think we're going there quickly, but here's the problem we're up against. Um, you know, if you look at every other form of transportation other than rockets, so planes, trains, cars, and boats, they all cost you about three times as much as the fuel costs you to operate. So if I put 100 bucks of, ga of, of, of gas in the tank, I'm gonna spend another $300 on depreciation and insurance and maintenance. And, uh, and the reason why that's true for all other forms of transportation is because they're all completely reusable, right? You, uh, when you go fill up your car with, with gas, let's suppose it was more like a rocket to where you fill up your car with gas and the first thing you do is crush the car, buy a new car, and fill it up with gas. Well, now your $100 tank of gas has also become a $100,000 car at the same time. And guess what? No, none of us would do very much driving if that was the case. And that's basically where we are right now. It, it, it's literally about 100 times. The multiple of the fuel is, uh, to the cost of the flight is about 100x. Um, but that's changing very rapidly right now. Uh, for example, you know, the SpaceX uh, vehicles are already very efficient. Uh, they've taken the price per person from 100 million, maybe down to 20 million for their first vehicles are going up. Uh, as they're getting their first stage and even their capsules to be reusable, that price should come down into the ones of millions. So already, by the way, we're going from hundreds of millions to ones of millions. That's already profoundly better. Uh, and it's important to point out, like on my mission, I paid a few tens of millions to go on my flight, but I earned back a few ones of millions. And so as soon as the price of access is down to the ones of millions, I'm going back every chance I get because I'll make a profit at it. And you all are at least as good as entrepreneurs as I am. And so odds are you'll be thinking of reasons to fly your own selves into space once the price gets that low. But it's actually gonna go even lower. Uh, oh, and by the way, SpaceX on Monday is making their third attempt at landing their first stage. So we'll hope that that goes well. But it actually, the theoretical floor is actually even lower than that, and there's companies now building next generation propulsion, which is gonna reduce the cost of access to space by yet another order of magnitude. Uh, and if you think about most, most rockets, all rockets for the past 50 years have been chemical rockets. And that means you carry the fuel and the oxidizer and tanks on board. And 85% of the mass of a rocket is fuel and oxidizer. That only is 12% for the superstructure that holds it all together, and that only is 3% for the payload. And we need, so that's, that's one of the major reasons for this, uh, this, up, this upside downness in, the, in the, the pricing structure. And so one of the ways to do that, one of the ways to fix that is instead of carrying your fuel and oxidizer with you to create the energy you need to eject something out the back at high velocity, you instead beam the energy from the ground. And so by beaming energy through some, either lasers or a uh, more common case I think now is high power microwaves, Instead of carrying fuel and oxidizer, you, you reduce the, the weight of that fuel and oxidizer, you get rid of it, uh, and that lets you spend much more of that uh, mass on payload and superstructure. And in fact, when you're beaming energy, you're only limited by how much energy you can beam, not by how much energy you can carry. And so it actually makes vehicles that are more powerful and much lighter at the same time. And there's a, a couple of examples of this electromagnetic propulsion being built. One is already being flown up the, this uh, Vasimir, uh, 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 ionic engine uh, that is l uh, very efficient but only puts out a very small amount of thrust and so it's great for once you're in space to either keep the space station up or maybe go to Mars when you can leave the engine on 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Uh, it'll cut the t journey time to Mars to about 39 days as opposed to 9 months. Um, and there's one that actually my wife is working on. She's now president of a company called Escape Dynamics and they're building a school bus sized space plane <laughs> pardon me, <clears throat> a school bus sized space plane that they will take grid electricity, store it in batteries over a few hours, dump that energy out of those batteries very quickly over about five minutes, put that energy through high power microwave sources, beam it to the belly of that, that aircraft. There's a two meter wide by six meter long heat exchanger on it. Uh, hydrogen flows through that, gets super, super heated, much hotter than you would get out of just combustion. 
and it ejects out the back at even higher velocity than you would get out of combustion, and you're not carrying any fuel or oxidizer on board. And so it makes a little vehicle like this, a little space plane, it still has a large tank for that hydrogen that it's gonna shoot out the back, uh, but it means that you, uh, the price per kilogram, for example, today, if you wanna send a CubeSat that weighed one kilogram, the price, the average price is about $50,000 per kilogram. On my wife's vehicle that you see right here, the price will be $250. The price for a human body at that rate is $15,000. So we're gonna go from 100 million to $15,000. And I'm sure you can do that math and go, A, you could probably go yourself, just literally with the money you saved up over a few summers, a and or if you've got some real work to do, it's like completely uh, uh, no longer an issue. And so that's the future that I sincerely believe is coming uh, that you all will get the chance to participate in is looking at this curve of the cost, and that's a, uh, a logarithmic curve there. Uh, and so the pr price is dropping very, very fast. Uh, and the, the, you know, the theoretical floor of the even chemical rockets will now be exceeded with electromagnetic rockets. And as soon as we get the you know, re re returns greater than the price, obviously all of us, uh, I, I expect, will be going quite a bit. And so here's how I think that's going to unfold. You know, we're already at the point where suborbital rockets are being built. Uh, uh, you know of Virgin Galactic, of course, and probably XCOR and Mastin, uh, but also uh, Blue Origin. Uh, Jeff Bezos' company just announced they're going to start their suborbital test program uh, here in the next uh, months. Uh, you know, the Google Lunar X Prize is already going back to the moon. Uh, there's a number of teams that are competing for that prize, and I actually already have property on the moon. I purchased Lunacod 2 that is on the moon, I purchased from the Russians, and so one of the bonus prizes is to go land by an existing artifact, and the Russians and the Americans have already said don't land near ours, so mine is actually the target. So we'll have a little private exchange on the, on the moon. You know, Bob Bigelow is going to be flying a private inflatable space station com component to the space station as an extra lab uh, later this year. And, uh, and while flying, uh, you know, on the press conference, people were talking about the red tape and legal issues of getting things through the governmental structure. Well, now we're going to have a private option on the side, so that's going to make it much easier and cheaper to, uh, uh, to get uh, uh, experiments performed on the space station as well. And that's uh, going to bring back, again, more things like these protein crystals. Uh, there's companies uh, back in Austin that are doing uh, vaccine development. Uh, you probably have heard that Google and others are putting up now constellations, like internet constellations in low Earth orbit. Uh, these are actually, uh, what's happening is there's a transition from, instead of sending giant satellites all the way to geosynchronous orbit, instead send a fleet of very tiny satellites that uh, if one breaks, it's throw away and you throw up another one, put them in a constellation much closer to the Earth, you get shorter ping times, uh, you get closer views, uh, the vehicles are more disposable, uh, it's a lot cheaper to get there, and the, and the price can keep coming down. And so all of these kinds of experiments you can do much closer to the Earth are now going to think going to be, the, in fact, already are, the, the growing, the fastest growing segment of things made up in space. Uh, even space-based solar power, I think, is now going to finally gonna become popular with this cheap access. Um, I'm uh, one of the uh, co-founders and investors in a company called Planetary Resources. We're actually going to go mine asteroids, which uh, I can talk about later if anybody's interested, that I think is also going to be particularly valuable. You know, there's lots of asteroids out there, and many of them are the metallic cores of protoplanets that were broken up during the early formation of the solar system uh, and have lots of platinum, for example, on them, as others have lots of water on them. Uh, many of them hang out very close to the Earth. You know, there's, there's these things called trojans that are orbiting the Lagrange points. And, uh, and so they're actually much easier to reach than the moon because there's no real gravity around them. You know, we have to worry about planet defense these days. We've actually already had a number of, uh, you know, newsworthy meteors have entered the Earth's atmosphere, but there's much bigger ones that we know are going to come very close to the Earth. So, you know, uh, in 2029, uh, you can look at this one called Apophis. It's going to come mighty close to the Earth. See how, see how, notice, notice how much closer than the moon's orbit that is, and it's going to come so close the Earth's actually going to deflect its uh, path through space uh, substantially. Uh, my company Space Adventures already has two clients signed up to go around the moon on a free return trip around the moon. Uh, Dennis Tito, the guy that flew with us first, is, got a, is sponsoring a thing called Inspiration Mars, which is trying to do a flyby of Mars uh, in 2021. 
You know, NASA has its flexible path to, to Mars that includes stop-offs at asteroids, you may be able, may even stop off, uh, you know, at uh, the moons around Mars, or uh, maybe go to Europa to look for life under the water, and then uh, then we get to the big target that everybody now talks about, which is Mars. And so I've gone from in ten years, I've gone from believing we were never going to get to Mars, at least within my lifetime, uh, because even though a president might stand up and say, "Let's go to Mars," a thirty-year, thirty billion dollar project has no political way to even start funding, much less continue it through economic ups and downs and regime changes. Uh, but uh, I think we finally now have gotten to this flexible path and this proper private uh, public partnership route uh, that I think has finally put us inexorably on the path to reach Mars. So I think that now it finally, uh, I've reversed my, skepticism, my skeptic opinion into believing that now we will get there. And in fact, you know, my company, Space Adventures, has already risen to being the sixth largest space agency on Earth. And so uh, by the number of people flown, and we actually have another, our next client, Sarah Brightman, is in Russia right now training for a flight this fall. And so, uh, so this really can be done. So thinking that, thinking that space was, you know, expensive and difficult and thus rare, which it was, Thinking that that was, however, inevitable or going to remain true would, would be wrong thinking. We now really truly are entering a new golden era of human space exploration, I believe. And I think the only decision that lies before you all is what part do you want to play? So thanks. <laughs> and we'll see if, they've, if I've left any time for questions. Do we have uh, time for a question or two? Do we have any questions? Oh, and the blue shirt, go away for the mic. So all of this sounds very exciting and I can see how the technology will allow us to get into space and different companies, both you know, private and public, will build the craft to get there. Um, do you see any uh, issue with <coughs> conflict in terms of who will actually uh, drive these spaceships, right? If you look at commercial airlines, a lot of the pilots come from the Air Force, the Navy. I mean, there's some from private areas, but it's mostly from the military because that's, they have the background to fly. Is that what would happen here where all the astronauts you listed would then start doing this privately, taking people up, or how would that work? Well, well the good news is that a space crew needs a variety of skills. Uh, you know, when I went to my own training, I actually had to take all the same courses as any other astronaut or cosmonaut had to pass all the same courses. But, but everyone has to pass them to the first level of, which is called user. It means I'm qualified to use, an, in an emergency, I can use any of the equipment. One person on the crew has to be the expert on each system. And it doesn't have to be the same person, but you can't put a crew together unless there is one person who knows how to repair the radio if it breaks, and another person who knows how to repair the toilet if it breaks. And so uh, for most professional astronauts and cosmonauts, they want to become an expert on as many of those as they can because it means they can be assigned to any crew. And in fact, uh, it hardly matters who else is assigned to their crew if they're if they're an expert level on all those systems. Whereas I had to fly with experts in all those other systems. And so when you get to the, you know, so if you think of that, that analogy of you know, military test pilots, someone on the team is going to likely have that kind of background. However, we're now past the age, you know, most all these vehicles are not completely completely automated. The Soyuz is 100% automated. You in theory could take over and try to fly it manually, you really wouldn't want to. It would be very dangerous to do things manually on, on that vehicle. And so it's really entering data, confirming the data from the ground, and punching the go button. Uh, over and over, there's a lot of it, and you're monitoring lots of systems, so, you know, you have an abort button, you can override it if you ever decide you need to, but, uh, uh, but you're going to see that, uh, you know, since a lot of the work that's being done now is science, uh, there's going to be people from all walks of life and all fields of science, in addition to some who will come on as the, the, the stick jockey. Someone else? Hi, uh, really interesting talk. So you, um, you write here now, what part will you play? Can you describe some of the parts do you think are available? Yeah, you know, uh, it, what's interesting, what I found was interesting in uh, my journey, because I've, my journey is very non-traditional, you might say. Um, and I think that the, the first thing, like for the app developers, what I said uh, to uh, some folks earlier today is, is that uh, 
the best thing to do is cozy up to the space industry and look for the, the failure points. And for me, the first opportunity was, for example, the piece of software to be able to photograph targets out the window with some level of reliability and speed uh, because everything's scheduled so tightly. And there were tons of moments like that. Uh, there, you know, there, if, you, if you look at the space station, uh, when things were built in the old ways, that means they're built very conservatively and with tons of red tape, and it means everything is pretty old, and it means nobody's willing to do anything that is newfangled uh, because it doesn't fit the pattern. Uh, and what's happening now is the commercial guys are coming in and saying, you know, screw that, we're just going to go do it and you know, pay us if we get you there. Uh, but, they're, they're little, but, they're, but they're all over the map. Like, for example, another one that they came up when I was flying is, uh, if, if I wanted to take my iPhone to keep my schedule on or a little Microsoft uh, you know, watch to keep my calendar on, the answer was I, I was not allowed. And the reason why I wasn't allowed is they were worried about glass breaking on the front of something. By the way, there's tons of glass already up there, so it, that's really irrelevant. And the other reason was there is a, uh, a lithium ion battery in here that's not space rated. And so they wanted to pull the batteries out, put on a separate battery pack on the back and rewire it manually. And for all of that qualification, they want to charge about 100 grand. And then beyond that, by the way, there's no 110 volt outlet, nor is there a 12 volt outlet. There's 100 volts DC and there's 24 volts DC are the only two power outlets on board the International Space Station. So anything that needs to be powered into the wall has to have a custom uh, char charger that is built that also has to be rated, which also costs another $100,000. And so I'm going, you guys are, you know, this is idiotic. That we're, that, you know, and when I talked to my father about this, who's an astronaut, he, by the way, if he was stand, I, I gave a speech with him yesterday, he would give this, he would, he had the opposite impression of me, going, like, when you're already talking about spending billions, you know, who cares if you're gonna spend 100 grand on a, you know, charger? And I'm going, like, well, that's the point. We're not trying to spend billions. You know, we're trying to use things that are off the shelf as much as possible. And so it does matter, in my mind, that we you take everything down to, you know, operate as close to the way it does on Earth as possible. So once you cozy up to these systems, you see these inefficiencies all over the place, and that's really, I think, the opportunity for, for all of us is to go fix those things and make them, you know, bring them back into alignment with, you know, normal life. We've got a question over here. Yeah. So uh, first of all, I wanted to <laughs> thank you for being so inspiring. Um, I'm a huge so Lord British fan. Thank you. Since my childhood. Um, so um, I'm actually part of the hackathon here, and we were spinning a, uh, around a problem with uh, around uh, an app, app idea around visualizing uh, the problem of low orbit space debris. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering what's your <coughs> opinion on that and most specifically on the Kessler syndrome. I don't know if you're uh, familiar with it. It's kind of like the exponential problem of having junk up there e right. essentially uh, leading up to more and more junk right. and how dangerous that is. What yeah, okay, so doing. yeah, great, a great thing, by the way, for an app to do. So I, first of all, I applaud your, uh, your vision to take, tackle that problem. Uh, you know, the space station is actually moved three or four times a year on average uh, in order to get it out of the way of a potential collision with debris. And that's the debris they can see. And what I mean by see is NORAD tries, or you know, some part of the government tries to radar, identify, and track as much of this debris as they can. Uh, but they can only track it down to you know the tip of your thumb or somewhere that somewhere in that order of magnitude a uh, size piece of debris, and uh, and and as you were mentioning, if you think about uh, debris or meteorites for that matter, you know there's fewer giant ones and more and more smaller ones. So the smaller meteorite or the smaller piece of debris, uh, you tend to go much higher in frequency. And if you go on the space station, some of the modules were launched 10, 12 years ago, and some are brand new. If you look at the brand new ones, their windows are perfectly pristine and clean and clear. Uh, but if you go to the original ones, they're pockmarked, like you were driving your car and got hit by rocks, but they're pockmarked a, with a lot of pockmarks. And so the oldest windows, you know, that might be, you know, 10 centimeters or so around, have 10 to 100 little scratches, you know, on them. And, uh, and those are from things about, you know, the size of a of paint, which you could never track. But something the size of a BB would actually go through a spacesuit and the astronaut en route. And, uh, and you can't see those, th that level of debris. So that's one of the reasons spacewalks are particularly dangerous is because of the potential debris impacts. Uh, and uh, you know, if, if, if you watch the movie Gravity, 
you know, one of the interesting things, they didn't really talk about much in that, that movie, but it was, and while they took a lot of artistic license in many areas, uh, you know, one of the interesting truths is that if you're in orbit with a piece of debris, you're both going around the Earth every 90 minutes uh, when they use 90 minutes in their movie, but actually you'll probably re-encounter things about every 45 minutes on each opposite side of the Earth. You'll re, uh, you know, come close to uh, having a collision. Um, and so, yes, this orbital debris is a huge issue, and that's actually one of the reasons why the space station uh, uh, is, is so low. By putting it not way out in space, but very close to the atmosphere, slight, slightly in the atmosphere, it means they have to keep boosting it to keep it from falling into the atmosphere, but it also means that any debris that is in that same orbital slot, will its orbit will degrade, and, uh, and eventually it'll re-enter. But that tends to help keep it clean around the space station. Uh, but as we go further into space, this is gonna become a bigger and bigger problem. Uh, and as more things break, uh, it's gonna become a bigger, it already is becoming a bigger, bigger problem. Okay, we've got a question over here. So do you think that New York could become a space hub just like DC or Southern California? And if so, um, in which ways your, the organization that you work for could help this happen? Yeah, so what's interesting about New York, so I'm a relatively recent transplant here to New York, and, uh, uh, and so when you say hub, there's two kinds, there's a spaceport, and then there's the hub of development. Uh, space, uh, New York is actually not gonna be a great place for a spaceport just because of the population density, and people aren't gonna like you to accidentally drop rockets on people's heads. Uh, but as a, a hub of, of intellectual uh, activity, I think that actually New York can be great. Uh, I can only give you anecdotal evidence as to this con of what needs to happen based upon my experience in the computer gaming field, which is related to technology evolution. W one of my disappointments originally when I came here to New York was that you know while in Austin, Texas, which is a great hub of creativity and art, uh, everybody was doing original intellectual property and creating original games and really moving uh, the art form and the technology form forward. When I arrived in New York, I found that most software developers in New York, to me, appeared to be doing things like advertising apps for the Martha Stewart show. Uh, and while that's a perfectly fine app to make, it's really made to, uh, as a marketing move, to take advantage of intellectual property. And New York felt to me like more of a, a financial deal place rather than a true technological innovation environment when I arrived. Now, that's what I think New York is trying to change and I now see a, a bigger grassroots group uh, coming in behind that saying, we're no longer happy to just do work for hire from a marketing agency. We actually want to do true uh, technological advancement within these, uh, these fields. Uh, and so I think uh, yeah, the answer is yes. Can New York do it? Absolutely. Uh, are they there yet? Uh, I would say not quite yet. I heard uh, on the press conference that New York is building itself now as already the number two in the world after probably Silicon Valley. Uh, I haven't seen that data yet, but that bodes also obviously very well for New York. Uh, but uh, I'm very excited to see things like, uh, you know, you have a spacesuit maker, you know, here in, in town. Uh, you've got, uh, uh, you know, a number of uh, biological research uh, companies here in town that are doing space work. Uh, so you have the right foundation, you have the right youth kind of growing up and into it. Uh, so I think just stay focused on it and give it a few years and uh, New York should emerge uh, very strongly. Okay, well, I, I'll bet I've used more than my time. I'll, I'll come over and talk to you afterwards uh, as well. So uh, I'll be here. I'm not in a hurry to head out. I'm going to go down and visit with the students as well, or the, the, not just students, but all the people making the apps. So uh, thank you so very much for listening to me today. Thanks. Thanks.